welcome to this episode of a Cancer Conversation with the Georgia Cancer Center at Augusta University. My name is Chris Curry, and I am your host for this podcast series. Uh, today, joining me for today's discussion is Dr. Jorge Cortez. Dr. Cortez is the director of the Georgia Cancer Center, so I'm very honored to have you joining me for this conversation. I know you're a very busy person. Um, Today we're going to be talking about a type of leukemia that's called chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, Dr. Cortez, you are an internationally known physician for treating patients with CML, so that's chronic myeloid leukemia. So this is going to be a fantastic discussion about what it is, how it can be treated, and what sort of advancements we might see in the coming years. So thank you very much for sitting down with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I want to start with just the very basic question of what is leukemia? Leukemia is, well, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a cancer of the blood. So um, what happens is the um, production of the blood, which happens in the bone marrow, uh, it's, uh, it becomes abnormal. There is a disturbance that causes the maturation of the cells to go wrong. Uh, and they start uh, producing more cells than than normal, and and these cells tend not to be very functional. In general, we classify leukemias into two types: the acute leukemias and the chronic leukemias. In the acute leukemias, what happens is that the whole process of maturation stops. So you see all these baby cells, you know, the very early stages of the process of developing blood. Uh, these baby cells, they don't mature anymore. We call them blasts, and there's an increase in the number of blasts. So those are acute leukemias. And then you have the chronic leukemias, where the maturation moves forward. Um, there is more maturation, sometimes all the way to the most adult cells, but they produce too many, and, and they're not completely normal. Uh, but there's a constant accumulation with no control of these, of these cells. Uh, both scenarios are, are bad. Uh, the acute leukemias are more aggressive, more explosive. Um, the outcome without treatment can be very bad in the very short term. The chronic leukemias have a lot of a, a, a bit of a more indolent, slow pace of progression. But ultimately, it's a cancer. You know, if not treated properly, they they can advance and and, and lead to the same bad consequences. And I understand that leukemia can happen in both adults as well as pediatric patients, kids. So what are the differences in that in those kinds of cancers between adults and kids? Is, are there differences? There, there are differences, yes, and, and indeed you're, you're correct. And in children, actually, the uh, one type of these acute leukemias, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, is the most common cancer that the children have. Leukemias in adults are uh, a relatively uncommon cancer. They represent about 1% to 2% of all cancers. Um, the other the important difference is that chronic leukemias are much less common in children. Uh, chronic myeloid leukemia happens infrequently. Chronic lymphoblastic leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, almost never in children. Um, it's more of the, of the acute leukemias. Um, the counterpart of that is that the acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children is highly curable. Fortunately, um, the treatment is good, and a, a large majority of the patients are cured. Um, so the, the possibility of cure is much better in children than it is in adults for this leukemia. Now, we've, we've interviewed you before and sort of talked about your background growing up in Mexico, your medical career, but I want to focus on why you decided to be a cancer doctor, largely focused on CML patients. Well, I, um, my initial goal of getting into hematology was to go into coagulation. That was an area that I was, that was fascinated with. You know, how the blood clots and, and when, when it, that becomes abnormal, how you prevent it and all of those things. Uh, but as I was doing my rotations, um, one of my initial rotations uh, at MD Anderson was uh, with, a, with a mentor of mine, Dr. Susan O'Brien, who was a leukemia expert, who is a leukemia expert. And, um, and it, it became fascinating to me all the work that, that she was doing, 
all the options that were um, available for patients, the, the treatments. Um, and so I, I started focusing more in leukemia. Uh, then I started working with, uh, with uh, some people that were uh, very established in, in, uh, in chronic myeloid leukemia. Perhaps the, the, my, one of my biggest mentors, Dr. Moshe Talpas, um, who was a, a well-known expert in chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, and, you know, he took me under his wing, and, and so I started working. It just happened that as I started, as I was doing that, there was a big shift in the uh, treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia, um, and I was very fortunate to be there, to be working with Dr. Talpas and, 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 and be, the, see the development of all these new drugs. So um, it was a very you know, good coincidence having good mentors, being in a in a situation to see all these new advances right happening place. in front of your eyes. Right place, right time. Awesome. Exactly. So <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Um, now we talked about leukemia. It's a blood cancer. It starts in the blood. But how do you know that your leukemia, your type of leukemia, is chronic myeloid leukemia and not one of the other types? The advantage that we have in chronic myeloid leukemia is that it has a very specific marker that, you know, if you have that, you have chronic myeloid leukemia, and that is called the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, usually, uh, nowadays, a lot of patients are diagnosed without any symptoms. You're getting a blood test because you're getting an annual physical or, 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 or you're going to have a surgery or you know, something like that, and you're found to have an elevated white cell count. That's the first thing that kind of calls to the attention that there's something abnormal there. Um, and, and when that happens, then we, we look for these chromosomes. There's this Philadelphia chromosome. It's essentially a switch between chromosomes 9 and 22. They exchange a little piece of their material. And so if you have these high white cell count and all of that, and then you have the Philadelphia chromosome, that makes a diagnosis. So um, it, it is, it is uh, in a cubicle that, 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 that that's going to make the diagnosis, so then you know that you have to start the treatment. So the Philadelphia chromosome sounds like it was found by a Dr. Philadelphia or maybe in a Philadelphia lab in Pennsylvania. Where does the Philadelphia come from? Well, it, it, it was found in Philadelphia, it, and, and it's a remarkable uh, piece of history because um, it was a really a, 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 a study that, that changed history not only for for. for um, this disease, but in general, uh, but it's a. It, the, if you read the paper, it's a paper that's a couple of paragraphs long. It's very short, and in those days, the the tools that they have to investigate were not as good. So all they could see is that there was a very tiny chromosome. They called it a minute chromosome. So in the paper, it's described as a minute chromosome. Uh, it took a, a few years um, the, to. Um, for um, a remarkable investigator, Dr. Janet Rowley, um, who uh, identified that it was this switch between chromosomes 9 and 22. Um, and, uh, and, and in honor of the initial uh, investigator, Dr. Nowell, that, that, that was working in Philadelphia, it was called the Philadelphia chromosome. That's, uh, that's very cool to know. Um, someone who's diagnosed with leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia specifically, what sort of treatment options are available. You've talked about how treatments, you've seen treatment options change and evolve over the time of your career. Yeah, it, it, it's been a remarkable change. When I was in, in medical school and even in my residency, um, it was a chemotherapy, a mild form of chemotherapy, but that was all there was. And then I mentioned Dr. Moshe Talpas, he, he developed a, um, the, uh, a big, but it was a dramatic change in those days uh, with the treatment of a, with a drug called interferon, which is a substance that our immune system makes, but this was made into a drug. And it really changed chronic myeloid leukemia. That was the first big jump where we saw that some patients, you could um, see that Philadelphia chromosome going away, um, and it really improved the probability of survival for patients. Um, so that became a big shift. 
Stem cell transplant became also very important, and for a time it was a big discussion, whether you do interferon, do you do transplant, and, and there was a lot of debate, and for many years, those were the two options that we had. In um, around 1998, uh, there was the introduction of the first drug um, uh, the, of, of the type of drugs that we use today called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. This drug was called um, imatinib, um, in those days, STI-571. Um, and, and it is a drug that very specifically blocks the protein that comes from the Philadelphia chromosome. And by shutting it down, then the cells die, and that allows the normal cells to grow back. So that was unique. That was a, a major advance in those days. Time Magazine had a, 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 a cover uh, calling it the magic pill, um, the, the magic bullet, I'm sorry, and because um, and, it was just so dramatic. And um, so, you know, that was, that's what we call the first generation. Then came a second generation of drugs uh, that we still use today, the satinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib, and then there's come, there has come a third generation, ponatinib, and more recently, uh, yet another drug, asiminib. So now we have a lot of these drugs that they all have their own properties, they, they, you know, more efficacy, different side effects, and things like that. Uh, but that's how we treat, the, those are the kind of drugs that we use for most patients, that's all they, they, they need, one or, the, or, or, or another of these drugs. And why is it, why are they different generations of drugs? What makes them different? The, uh, one of the uh, differentiators is um, the potency. The second generation was a little bit more potent. Um, also in patients that had uh, not responded well, where the leukemia had developed resistance to the imatinib, Sometimes it's because the, the leukemia cells switch a little bit of that protein so it no longer is blocked by the drug. Okay. These second generation were able to overcome that in, in most instances. Um, and the third generation took that you know, a, a step further. Okay. Um, which treatment do you tend to recommend in the beginning of a cancer patient, a CML patient that comes to see you? Which treatment do you typically recommend first and why? The, of the, the, there are five of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors that, that are um, approved uh, today. Um, excuse me, there are six uh, now, six uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Four of them are approved as initial therapy. That's the imatinib, the, the first generation, and the three second generation, dasatinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib. They're all good. Um, imatinib is, is a very, very good drug. Different studies have shown that the this, this second generation are, give us better responses, faster responses, more responses, et cetera, than imatinib. So um, in, in, in most instances, we prefer to use the second generation. Uh, but there are occasional patients where imatinib is, is what you use, and in some parts of the world, that's the only drug that's available, and it's a very good drug. The advantage of having all these choices is that you can select them based on the patient characteristics. Not only the disease, but for example, their, whether they have diabetes, they have um, uh, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. Some of these drugs may have a higher risk of giving you uh, some side effects versus others. So you can, you can tailor that to what is probably better expectation of how a patient can tolerate a given drug versus the other. So, so the advantage of having all these choices is that you can make those decisions based on that. But really everybody gets one of these drugs. Okay. Um, how long is the treatment process with these medications and what is that experience like for patients? Well, uh, that is something that is changing. When we started with these drugs and for many years, we, we said this is great treatment, you're just gonna have to take your treatment for the rest of your life. Not a bad thing if you have cancer and what you need is to take a pill and that's going to keep you free of cancer. Yeah. It's not a bad trade-off. We wish we had many other cancers where that was the case. And there are a lot of many, there are a lot of other diseases out there where people take a pill a day to keep whatever that disease is under a it, check. Exactly. You have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you have you know high cholesterol. You take a pill and 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 you know the 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 goal is that and that is not going to be, uh, you know, affecting your life. Uh, but, you know, we also 
get ambitious um, and, and, and also, you know, these drugs, they're very, very good, but they do have some side effects and, and maybe not unmanageable, but in, inconvenient and uncomfortable for many patients. Uh, fatigue, for example, becomes a common one. But a few years ago, we identified that there's a subset of patients that if they get to a very, very good response where you can hardly see any leukemia by these very powerful tests that we do, and that, that they get to that situation for at least two years continuously, you can consider stopping therapy. Um, and when you do that, about half of the patients can remain without treatment. The other half, it comes back, now you, you start the treatment again and they respond again, um, but in at least a subset of patients, you can eventually stop therapy. You have to be careful. You need to make sure that you're doing it in the right patient, that they have the right setting, um, that, that it's not going to be a, a, a high risk for the patient to stop therapy. But at least we're starting to get to the point where some patients, right now, unfortunately, a minority, probably about 25 to 30 percent of patients total can stop therapy. Um, and, and that's one of our big goals now. How can we improve on that? Um, so that, uh, you know, at least 50% or a majority of patients can stop therapy. And so we talk about having the four, the first and second generation medications available for initial therapy. When does that third generation, that newest generation come in? Well, you know, th these Drugs are very good, the outcomes are very good, but a good number of patients, unfortunately, they, they don't have a good response to therapy. Um, there's a few others where they, they cannot take the medication because they, it causes accumulation of fluid around the lungs or damage to the kidneys or something like that. Not a common thing, but it happens. Um, so then, then you go to those that third generation, um, which... Um, particularly when the patients have not had a good response at all with the first or the second generation drugs, then, uh, then these newer drugs, they, they give you a good chance of, of now responding. So, so that is a good scenario. And there is one particular mutation of that, that happens in that protein from the Philadelphia chromosome that's called the T315i, um, where the first and second generation, we know don't, they don't work at all. Uh, it's just a small percentage of patients, but when a patient has that mutation, definitely the new generation. So there are a few instances where, where those drugs become very valuable. And you talked about fatigue being one of the more common side effects. What are some other common side effects that you see, and does it differ in age and race and that sort of thing when it comes to the side effects? It, it does. Um, it, you know, the, the, it, it changes from drug to drug. There are some things that are somewhat common to all of the drugs, maybe one a little bit more than the other, but, you know, the fatigue is common to all the drugs. Sometimes a drop in the white cell count in the platelets, um, they, 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 those can be common to, to all the drugs. Um, others are a little bit more common with one drug versus another one. I mentioned accumulation of fluid around the lungs, for example. That's something that we see with the satinib, not so much with some of the other drugs. Um, there is accumulation of, uh, of uh, fluid in the legs, around the uh, eyes. We see that with imatinib more than with the other drugs and, and so on. Um, there are some patients, uh, older patients tend to have more side effects, but it also have more um, of other medical problems, which, which creates a, a, a higher setting for some of the more complex side effects, for example, heart attacks and strokes and things like that. When, when you have patients that have already diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol, and then you add these drugs, the risk of those things are higher. And... How often does someone have to get that blood test? You talk about getting the blood test, seeing that there's no leukemia, no CML in the blood, but how often are you checking? Is it monthly, every three months, every six months? We, we do it, uh, of course, at the time of diagnosis, and then we do it uh, usually every three months once you start the treatment. Once the patient gets to have a good response, um, 
there's a level of response that we call a major molecular response, for example, um, which is essentially a three log reduction in the amount of disease from the start. Um, that's usually a good time where you can switch to every six months. Uh, it's only a blood test, so it's relatively easy to do. Um, doing it more frequent can cause confusion and you know because there's a little bit of variability in the test. So every three to six months is right about what we do most of the time. And are they just is someone in a lab counting the number of leukemia CML cells? You talk about seeing a, a decrease. Is that based on the number of cells that are present in the sample? What you measure is actually not the cells. Um, I mean, it is a reflection of the cell count, indeed. Uh, but what you are measuring is the DNA. So you break the cells, you, you get the, the, the DNA to see how much uh, there is of that abnormal gene that comes from the Philadelphia chromosome compared to a normal gene that you know that should be there and see that, that, that ratio. Um, you know, we have a fantastic molecular lab here, Dr. Kudler, uh, excuse me, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Kudler has, has, has perfected these and, and it's a very, very reliable one. Um, so so we, we get, you know, very accurate results with that. Now we've talked about having a pill to take the, the different generation, the, the ty tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Yep. Um, when do you consider a stem cell transplant, a bone marrow transplant for a patient? No, stem cell transplants are not used as frequently now as, as, as we did before we had these drugs. Uh, but I think we are starting to rethink um, whether we have abandoned them too much. Uh, I think that in patients that have gone through two of these drugs um, and not had a good response, I think we need to start thinking about transplants a, a little bit earlier. Um, the other thing is that we've learned that some patients, in addition to having this abnormal gene from the Philadelphia chromosome, uh, they may have changes in other genes that are associated with other cancers. Um, it's about 20% of patients with, with CML. Um, and, and it frequently happens to be those patients that are not responding well to the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. I think those patients should be transplanted relatively early and not wait until they progress to the more advanced stage. Certainly, the more advanced stage, we want to do a transplant because that's the, pretty much the only hope for that patient. But it's ideal to do it before they get to that advanced stage. What gets someone to that advanced stage? Is it just waiting to go to the doctor to say something's wrong? Or what is it about leukemia? Because we know with solid tumors like breast cancer, it grows and grows and grows and then it spreads and metastasize or metastasizes to another part of the body and that's usually what defines a, a later stage cancer. But what about CML? Well, you know, it, it is a cancer, so um, so it's actually the same process. You know, if you left somebody without any treatments, um, we think that eventually everybody would go to, to that more advanced stage. Fortunately, we do have treatment that delays these, and it is a chronic leukemia, so it's not going to happen immediately. Of course, there's the occasional patient where that can happen, but usually it takes a, a few years to get there, but eventually it will. So, so a patient who's not treated, of course, will eventually get to the blast phase. <clears throat> a patient who's not responding to treatment uh, can eventually get to the blast phase. So... Um, I, I, that's the importance of, yes, being diagnosed early and, and, and treated early, but also to, to make sure that you intervene promptly when, when the patient is not having a good response, um, change the therapy, consider transplant, as we, as we said earlier. Okay. And talk to me about where we're going with treatment, because I know that you have been involved in a number of clinical trials, clinical research in... CML medications, what does the future look like? Um, one of our biggest objectives now with the treatment is how can we get more patients to stop therapy uh, 
you, you know, uh, well, without having to resume treatment later on. As I mentioned earlier, it's probably uh, successful in only about 25, 30% of the patients. That's great. You know, we, we, some years ago, we didn't think we, we could have that, but it'll be much better. It'll be, if it will be many more patients. So that's one of the biggest goals right now for treatment. Uh, but we also want to develop newer therapies uh, for two reasons. One is because there are still some patients where the treatments that we have are not effective, and some of them are too similar to the others so that, you know, it's, although I said we have six, you know, some of them are too similar that, you know, if you didn't respond to one, you're probably not going to respond to, if you didn't respond to a second generation, you're probably not going to respond to another second generation. They're almost equivalent in yeah. most instances. Uh, so finding newer drugs that work differently, that have new properties, but also that have fewer side effects. Because if many patients are going to have to live with the treatment for the rest of their lives, well, the less side effects that we have, and again, they're not usually very severe, but they're chronic, they're constant. And, you know, you can, you can probably most of us can handle having a little bit of a discomfort, a little bit of pain, a little bit of diarrhea, a little bit of something if it's going to be short-lived. But if it's going to be forever, then, then we need drugs that, that work better. When you put it in the context of chemotherapy, for example, these drugs are way better. Um, but again, if it's constant little something, uh, it's, it's not good for patients. So, so th those are the kind of things that we are working on, developing new drugs, new strategies to try to get us to that, to that point. And Dr. Cortez, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, I said at the beginning you were internationally known for CML, and I'm not just saying that for no reason. Talk about the work that you've done to educate doctors and people across the world about CML. Well, you know, we, um, we recognize that um, even with the limitations that many patients in the U.S. have about access to drugs and to good treatment and to monitoring and all of that, when you think about uh, everywhere all over the world, there are places where um, the patients have no access at all to even the diagnosis of CMAO, the, 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 the medications, the monitoring. And the doctors don't have the, the free access to information to, to learn about uh, what to do for a given patient, when do you change therapies, you know, all these things. Um, so you know, many years ago, um, a couple of colleagues uh, and I, uh, Dr. John Goldman, uh, who since passed away, and uh, Dr. Tim Hughes, John Goldman was from the UK, Tim Hughes from Australia, and I um, were having dinner and, and thought about starting an organization that could help uh, promote the knowledge and, and, and help patients all over the world um, to, to be better informed, to give them access to certain tools and, and so on. So we started something that's called the International uh, CML Foundation. Uh, and it's been around for, for many years, and it's been, I think, incredibly successful uh, in, in promoting that dissemination of knowledge and, and access uh, to, for example, uh, diagnostic tools and, and, and uh, other things. Um, we have expanded greatly. We've, we have now delegates and, and, uh, that uh, come from Asia, Africa, um, Latin America. And, and um, we did, for example, a preceptorship program where uh, physicians from the, all parts of the world would come to centers of excellence to learn how to set up a CML clinic and how they could do all these things. Um, and, and it's been very rewarding. Um, it, it's been, you know, the, the feedback that we get both from patients and from physicians, um, they, they really are very enthusiastic about the, all these education um, and, and other activities that we do. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to have been part of the genesis of this organization. Now I'm, I direct that organization. I'm, I'm, I'm the president of that organization. Um, and we want to continue uh, that that um, uh, process. We are now doing some research. You know, we're, we're doing learning more about the genetics of of, of CML. 
uh, learning more about the uh, CML in children because it's so uncommon that only putting the whole world together. When we had COVID, for example, very quickly we, we, we collected information from patients with CML from all over the world to learn what was happening to, to, to patients with, with uh, CML um, during COVID, where they're getting COVID, where they uh, uh, as sick as, as other patients or, or, or getting sicker or, or not. Uh, was the vaccine working in those patients or not? And, and those kind of things. And we collected uh, almost a thousand patients very quickly to, to understand the impact. And they came again from all over the world. So that made it very representative to different settings, different resources, different um, types of, of, of uh, exposures, et cetera. What did that data show you? Are you able to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, we, we learned that actually patients uh, were not at, at, at much higher risk than uh, patients, we, than individuals and the general population. Um, they, um, they were um, actually not getting as sick as patients with other leukemias that got COVID. Um, we, we also learned, um, however, that the better the response they had already to the treatments, the better they would do if they got COVID. The, the ones who had the worst prognosis were the patients who had not had a good response to the CML as well. Um, we also learned that you know different vaccines had different benefits than, than, than others. Um, the ones that we used uh, here, the, the Moderna, the Pfizer, th those were very good in protecting patients. Others um, had a, a little bit of a weaker protection, still better than not having the, the, the vaccine. So we, you know, we, we learned a lot very quickly. Oh, that's awesome. Well, Dr. Cortez, I appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with me today, um, to sit down for this conversation. I feel like people have hopefully learned a lot more about CML than they may have known when they started. So thank you very much. My pleasure. I, I hope I, I, this was helpful and uh, it was, it was uh, great to talk to you. And thank you for watching or listening. Remember, you can find A Cancer Conversation wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we are also on YouTube on the Georgia Cancer Center's YouTube channel. Just search A Cancer Conversation or Georgia Cancer Center and you should be able to find us. If you have questions for Dr. Cortez or any of our guests uh, or segments that you would want information about, you can send us an email. That's cancer at Augusta. Dot edu. That's A-U-G-U-S-T-A dot E-D-U. And uh, we will certainly work on getting those questions answered for you or, or bring those experts on to talk about those topics that you want information about. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we will see you next time.